I definitely felt adrift at sea, alone, and I, had, I felt like I, I needed to be known and understood by people, and that need wasn't being met or fulfilled. Hey, my name's Tom Froze. Welcome to my vidcast. I'm excited to be answering your questions about illustration. So I will eventually be getting a name for this thing and I'll be able to say, hey, welcome to the blah, 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 blah thing. And it'll be way more punchy. But for now, it's still just Tom Froze vaguely about answering your questions. I have a lot of exciting stuff to share with you. I did talk quite at length today, mostly stories from my own personal experience. Actually, I think they're all stories from my personal experience. So if you're interested in learning about how I established a creative community that really bolstered and started and launched my creative career as I know it today, then stick around and we'll have a great discussion. Okay, so here's some thoughts for the past week. I've heard from you guys that it's okay to do the chit chat and I like doing the chit chat. So the chit chat before the questions and answer period, stay. So, and oh, another preamble to this. I have so much on my mind for today, but anyway, this is my 10th episode. And so, you know, it's a significant even round number. And so I wanted to do something special for this episode. And while I do have some of your questions on the backlog, I do want to share with you a special story that I kind of just remembered this week. Basically, it's the beginning or the genesis of my career as a creative. And I, I'm excited to share it with you. So it's sort, of, sort of a story and it might be a little bit meandering and expansive. But yeah, I think I think it's it's an important story that you'll get to hear in due time. So anyway, here's my chit chat for the week. So yeah, I've been working on gratitude always, perpetually, because I am the least grateful person. And what I mean by grateful and gratitude is just staying positive, seeing the cup half full, being thankful for the good things in life and not complaining about the things that could be better. And we all know there are tons of things in life that could be better. There's always something that could be better. That's life. And for me, gratitude means instead of getting angry about these things that annoy me, I need to see my gains and not my losses. And especially with client work, when you've been doing this a long time, I start to feel very entitled and and indignant when I get the wrong kind of feedback or the wrong kind of client asks me if I want to do work for them. And so I, I need to always remain in that place of gratitude where I'm like, I get to do draw for a living. And even if there's some jobs that I'm not super excited for, I need to be thankful for those people who singled me out of the hundreds of thousands of us. I don't know how many illustrators there are in the world, but right? Someone who came to you to do creative work and hopefully meaning meaning well to pay you and you know actually do something that you'll enjoy. So for me, I, I'm always working on that. That's that's my personal struggle is is not not being so quick to be annoyed at things that don't go exactly perfectly my way. And that's not to say I shouldn't be, I, I don't get to be a little bit selective after a certain amount of experience of illustrating and, you know, that's the privilege where we enjoy with experience is we get to be more selective and, and, and choose our jobs a little bit more according to what we want to do and, of course, ask for the fees that we believe we're worth. So gratitude balanced with being business savvy, if you will. So anyway, gratitude is something I'm perpetually working on. And here's just like a funny little example of how I can shift from being a complainer to being grateful. So it rains a lot here on the West Coast. Rain, it probably rains more than two thirds of the year. It's raining right now. And I bike to I bike to my studio, and it's 
obviously important that I stay dry. So I put on my slush pants and my waterproof jacket and I put my briefcase into my waterproof bag and you know I just I, I just look like I'm wearing a spacesuit basically and whenever I have to do this whole thing that takes me like five minutes to get into and I have to wear my rubber boots too right so I'm wearing waterproof everything, including footwear, and there's an order that I have to put it on, and it's awkward getting my briefcase into my rain bag. And so I get kind of annoyed every day. I'm like, oh, I gotta do this. I gotta uh, pack all this, go through this rigmarole every day, two times a day. And I forget that, A, I get to bike to my work. And mo most people who have career jobs have to drive to work and get, they, they get in traffic jams and spend hours of their day just sitting in a car. So I get to bike to work. So I'm flipping around my, my complaint to an angle of gratitude. The other thing is that I have rain gear. I can bike and stay dry in the rain because I have all this gear. That's why I bought it. So anyway, it's sort of like, oh, I gotta put on this gear, but I can be thankful that I have the gear. And so this is the thing that I, I try to do in my life, in my career all the time is, is say, what, what do I have to work with? And how can I work with that? Because you can't have what you don't, or you can't have what you can't have. And you have to work with what you do have. And that resourcefulness is what's gonna help you create and forge and maintain a creative career. So that's, that's one, one thought I've had this week. Another thought here is about, so right now and every year, I think around in April, there's this thing called the 100 day project. That's a hashtag, hashtag the 100 day project. And it's an Instagram thing. And basically you spend 100 days doing one thing over and over again. So some people are choosing to do a kind of drawing with their favorite kind of marker or based on a certain kind of theme and there's there's no no like limit to what you can or cannot do as long as you're doing this one thing for 100 days and so I chose to do a hundred days of noses because all my characters have basically pointy noses and I wanted to just play around with that in an experimental and self-referential way and I wanted an exercise that would take me five minutes or less because you know a project like that can be very intimidating unless you make it very manageable so I just said I'm gonna do it on sketch paper and uh, take a black and white photo and do one quick doodle of noses and the hope was that I would I would get better and better every day and do something more and more clever and creative and people would be like oh this is awesome right this is my in my head and and that I would start getting really loose and free in the work and I would be fun so aside from my my fantasies of of people actually like really liking it and resonating with it I did have this genuine hope that I could do something a little bit looser with more freedom and more sketchy and not as tight as the things that I normally post on my feed. So today's day 13 or day 14, but I think by around day nine, I started just getting anxious about it. Like I wasn't happy with the things that I was making. I was worried that I was not getting enough likes on the things I was posting. And I was also worried that because this was starting to dominate my feed, I post about two posts on my Instagram every day. And one out of every two things, if you looked at my, my Instagram profile, was this thing that looked different than my other work. And so I was worried that I was alienating the followers who followed me for my normal mainstream of work. And so on Friday, I was thinking about how, how to solve this problem. Cause I was kind of tempted to just cut the project and be like, okay, this is, this is not going to work. Cause quite honestly, my following, I, I get 
you know, a certain amount of new followers every week that I expect. And then I just noticed that my, my, my following kind of flattened out and I was losing followers basically. For every followers I gained, I was losing followers. So while I'm not making things for the likes, uh, or at least ideally, and when I'm in a good place, I'm not making things for the likes, I also need to understand how Instagram works and how social media in general works. You have an audience and they follow you because they expect you to produce a certain kind of content. And if you stop serving them the content that they signed up for, you're going to alienate them and they'll probably unfollow you if they're not interested in your experiments. And so for me, I value more the people who follow me for things like my maps and my magazine illustrations and the things that look more like what they expect of me. And I think I, I, I just, I actually, I, I enjoy that, that dialogue of creating stuff and people in an audience out there responding to it. And I, but I also don't want to stop doing this project because I also value what this 100 day project represents. The 100 day project for me represents an opportunity just to see what happens if you do something every day and if, if you keep it simple. So I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move my 100 day project over to its own separate Instagram account and that solves the problem of anxiety about whether I'm alienating my main feed followers. And I'm going to make the actual process of making these things super simple. Because I was spending more time on these than I, like it ended up being like spending a half an hour on this thing that's supposed to be just a doodle. So I basically made my four rules of ones. I get one chance, one minute limit, one pen, and one color. One chance means I, I don't do any rehearsals. Whatever comes out, that's what I'm using. So that forces me to be spontaneous. I have a one minute limit, so I can't be precious. I have to be quick. That forces me to be more spontaneous too. I use one pen. I'm using my Pentel brush pen. Or no, it's not Pentel. This one's a Kuwatake. So brush pen and one color. I shoot it in black and white and, and post it in black and white. And so that's how I'm gonna, that's how I put my 100 day project in its place by giving it some limits and giving it some space where it doesn't start bleeding into something that I value in, in the wrong kind of way, which is my main feed. So that's how I, I've approached this. And um, yeah, I think, I think it just shows that some people are really good at just not caring about what people think on, on their main feed and doing whatever. And I guess I just have a very specific system and um, I'm a little bit neurotic. So that's, that's how I've, I've helped assuage my anxieties, if that's the right use of the term. I have so many things to share with you guys today, so I'm just doing a huge brain dump. So here's another thing that I thought about last week, and it's about the way I feel after a day of procrastinating. So when I start out the day and I know the things that I need to do and that I can do and could get done if I focused, if at the end of the day I've done those things, I will feel great. I will feel like I've accomplished something. That's a very natural thing to um, set a goal achieve it and feel good. There, maybe there's some kind of uh, a chemical release in your brain that happens because of that and, and it rewards us and makes us feel good. And that's why we eventually get, become disciplined because there's something in us that re rewards us with this chemical burst. I don't know. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm pretty sure that there's, maybe it's serotonin. There's, I don't know. I'm not going to be a, um, I'm not going to be a pseudoscientist anymore. But what I'm saying is it feels good, right? But when I set those goals and then spend most of the day procrastinating or being distracted by whatever, I feel terrible. And it just took me last week to write it down on a piece of paper and stick it up on my wall. And it just says, it feels bad when at the end of the day, I have not finished the work I set out to do and could have done had I stayed focused. So super obvious, but I got really excited about this realization and it really helped me for the rest of last week to stay on task. Okay, so at the beginning of this episode, I workshopped a little bit of a an intro or something. What I'm building up to is actually giving this vidcast a name 
and then branding it properly, building it out into something more. And I've been encouraged by the subscribers I've been getting and the likes, and it's still fledgling. And then, you know, I think it's slow growing, but I feel like I'm, I'm creating content that people uh, can, can benefit from and I'm, I'm hearing as much and I'm hoping to continue to get more questions. I've sort of reached a plateau of questions. I haven't been getting a ton more questions, but I'm hoping to get more of your questions to answer. And I think that's probably the going to remain the basis of this video cast. But at the same time, I've been enjoying just kind of basically vlogging, right? Just giving you my chit chat at the beginning and my thoughts. And I've been enjoying that part too. And I also hope as I develop this channel a little more to start having conversations with some of my peers in the industry. So these won't be interviews per se, but more conversations that I have with friends on topics. So maybe one illustrator and I will talk about um, saying no to clients. Maybe another illustrator and I will talk about balancing family life and work life. So I'm really excited about this. I've talked to a few creatives about this already and they're really excited about the idea. So it's just a matter of me setting this up so that, you know, getting the right equipment and software and all that and, and making that work and learning how to do it. But I'm, again, it's, it's us who have experience being able to give that to you in some way. So I announced last week that I have a workshop at the upcoming Icon Conference in Detroit in July. So I actually haven't checked to see if the workshop's full yet, but if it isn't, then yeah, but the workshop I'm teaching there will be called Inky Maps. And some of you may know that from my Skillshare classes. It's basically in person, we're going to be making a illustrated map but using digital and analog tools. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think one of the main value adds to taking the workshop versus doing the online class, of course, will be that you can ask me questions directly and I'll be able to kind of interact with you and your work a little more in that context. And then of course we get to meet each other and it's always great meeting students and, and uh, making friends. So that's that. So I do have a question for you guys. Um, so when you guys ask questions, I have been naming you. And I've just noticed that in some other Q&A format podcasts and videos, they tend to favor not naming the person who asked a question to keep them anonymous. And I wonder if maybe you guys would prefer that. I feel like if someone asks a question, it's their question. It's kind of like their intellectual property. I'm just giving credit to you for your question because that's that's creating the content, helping me create the content. If you guys would rather remain anonymous or have your name mentioned alongside the question, I'd, I'd be curious to know. So yeah, there's that. So anyway, yeah, now on to the, the main part of this today's episode, which is, which is something I'm excited about. Um, I was going to answer some questions, but I really think because this is the 10th episode, it's it's good to tell you um, uh, maybe a little story instead about how I kind of started from zero in my creative career. So I'm going to call this story Creative Breakfast. And there is no real zero moment in my creative career. I mean, our stories roots always go back way further than we can remember consciously. So maybe you like creativity and drawing and long to have a creative career but you're not even close to starting the journey or maybe you're kind of in a creative path or on a creative path but you haven't quite figured out how to get it to go where you want it to go and while I think people in both of these scenarios will get a lot out of this story I feel like my zero moment here the, the, story, the sort of beginning of this story starts when I was on, I sort of had some creative opportunities and I was maybe like dabbling in becoming a full-on graphic, a, a creative professional, in my case a graphic designer. But 
I wasn't I wasn't at all where I knew I wanted to be, which was to be doing the most creative work in the industry, kind of either with an advertising studio or a large design firm where they were doing really awesome, funky work that was kind of, you know, leading in the world rather than sort of just making logos for your uncle and stuff like that. And I'm not trying to disparage making logos for your uncle. I think that's that's where you start. You have to do stuff like that. But I wanted to see a path from doing those small itty bitty hack things to being in the big leagues. What I imagined being the big leagues at that point ended up being different for me than what they ended up being. Using the word big leagues is a little bit of a, a silly high school way of saying it, but you know, doing work that I feel like I'm doing my best and I'm, it's, exci it's exciting creative territory. So here's, here's where my story kind of starts. It's, uh, I loved graphic design, uh, but I was kind of entrenched in a career and a life track that felt like it was taking me away from an actual great design job. I, I had uh, already been working for a number of years from a company as a technologist, and then I ended up going to school for a technology diploma so I could kind of continue down that path because I was inspired by the engineers around me to uh, that, that that was like a good, solid career choice. It was kind of interesting to me and yeah I just felt like the community around me was more in the sort of circuits and computers kind of world and so I did that for a bit and I do talk about that actually uh, that specific uh, thing in a podcast called The Meaning Movement with Dan Cumberland and I will link that episode in the show notes and you guys can dig into that if you want but basically um, I had found myself into a graphic design job for a trampoline company and that job kept me busy for about two years and it was great, an amazing opportunity, but there were two things that I felt that were not where I wanted to be in it. And the one was that the job was just kind of, I felt like it, it, I didn't earn it, I didn't deserve it. I always had this feeling like here I was calling myself a graphic designer, but I hadn't been to school yet and I um, didn't feel like I knew everything that a properly trained graphic designer would know. And I guess we'd call this imposter syndrome. But I, I felt this strongly. But I don't think it was a um, misdirected feeling. Like I actually believe that I was onto something. Like I was like, there's a whole gaping hole in, in my knowledge and experience that as long as I'm in this job doing this graphic design that I'm doing now, I'll never grow into the kind of graphic design that I want to be doing. So... Um, the second thing was just that, well, yeah, so the, on the one hand, it was me having this job that was kind of given to me through a connection, and it didn't feel like I earned it. And two, I felt like in order to grow as a graphic designer, I needed to actually be in a community where I would, I would get mentorship and peer feedback. And for me, that community ultimately was art school getting a design degree. I had this sense while I was in this job that while I was getting experience, it wasn't a full story for me. So again, I needed mentorship and I craved creative community. People around me who could tell me whether I was on the right track and people I could be inspired by. I think that's really important. So someone at my job uh, who ended up actually being my karate sensei for about a year um, really inspiring guy to me, and um, I don't think I've ever properly thanked him. His name's Yasu, and we were talking about this one day, maybe over lunch, or we kind of shared a, an office room, so he knew that I was really interested in becoming a better designer, but I needed community, and maybe I, I, I shared my heart with him, and he said if I wanted creative community like that, I'd have to create it myself. Don't wait for someone else to um, make it, or or hope for the, the best opportunity. Make the opportunity. And it's so simple, it's such a basic thing, but I took it to heart and of course I respected him and so I took his advice to heart and and it meant something to me. So one, one, one suggestion he had was like, you know, why don't you meet over breakfast or something like that with, with friends who might be interested in creativity. And 
that's what I did. I, I was already part of a church community in uh, Toronto's downtown core. And this, this particular community had already in a lot of very uh, creative minded people. So I invited some friends that I thought would be interested in meeting for breakfast. And it wasn't just people who are interested in design. In fact, it was people in art school, like taking fine art. It was people who are interested in poetry. Um, there was a tattoo artist. And I basically invited a very diverse group of friends, people who I knew in my community to meet for breakfast, 7 a.m. on Mondays. And we met in Toronto at a place, I don't, I don't know if it's still there, I think it was called Java Hut. So we'd go and have breakfast and just talk about our creative hopes. And at first it was kind of unfocused and the way I, I tried to kick it off is super corny, but I, I created like ice, creative icebreaker exercises. So I can't even remember what they were to be honest, but there was one where I, that involved Tinker Toy and we were trying to make uh, some kind of a contraption as a group to meet some kind of goal. So maybe that was based in sort of my more engineering side. I don't know why some of these people decided to join. I mean, there there were people who are already established in like really. There was one who is that. There was one person who is a an incredible interior designer, like top of her game. Today she is still, and she was before. But yeah, I mean, these people came, there was a, an astrophysicist who joined us who, who like me, was in a career that was a bit more engineering oriented, and she, she wanted to kind of have some kind of creative outlet. She had a, a really popular knitting blog. And anyway, we ended up calling this, informally, we just started describing this meeting, Creative Breakfast. And I'm thinking about all these people that, that were so much a part of my life not just on the Mondays, but we, you, we would typically see each other on Sundays. And um, eventually we, we, um, we were starting working on a collaborative, pro uh, collaborative project that we saw a lot more of each other even. I'll get into that in a bit. Yeah, I mean, these people are all now in various, I mean, it was a long time ago. So we're all like parents now and have our own careers and stuff. But it was an exciting time. and. At the time, we, we forged really good friendships. And this idea that you can forge a community based on your common interest in creativity is really powerful. I think one thing that really helped was that we already were in a greater community. So if you can find people that are already part of a bigger community, and then you create a sub-community based on the specific interest, I think that's powerful. All this was before social media, which... I don't know what my, what I would have done differently had social media been what it is today then. Would I have felt the need for meeting with people directly in person at the crack of dawn on a Monday? I don't know, but I strongly believe that even today with social media, and maybe because of it, because it's all virtual and online, meeting with people in person physically is a really powerful Thing. At first we just started meeting generally and it was exciting just to meet and, and be a group of people who, who aspired to either creative career, which was in my case, or just being more artsy in general. Eventually we landed upon this idea that we were going to create an art show together in support of some kind of charity. So I knew nothing about art or shows or about charities to be honest. but. We found through some connections that there is an orphanage being run in Kenya and that touched our hearts and we were like, let's raise money for this orphanage. So that became kind of our cause and then we created a show and we created a show format where it was like people would create art on one foot by one foot canvases or panels and it would be open submission and we'd just have a show and charge admission at the door uh, charge for drinks and and raise money that way. The event itself actually ended up being profitable, not not by much. For all our efforts, we probably could have just given our own money and raised more for the orphanage. But I think just the fact that we worked together on this thing and created this this um, it was part art exhibition, part party, and we got into this independent gallery in uh, east on the east side of Toronto, 
and it was I don't even like it was just through connections and 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 really working together as a community that we made it happen and along the way not only were we meeting together in a spirit of creativity as a community but we were also now working on an actual creative project together and learning additional skills and having additional experiences that really were formative so for me i of course designated myself as the the graphic designer making the flyers and being the the web designer and the photographer and so i got to have all these that experience and i was also doing a lot of administration calling around and delegating i was kind of the group leader i guess which made sense because i had started the creative breakfast and, and so it was really amazing experience here we created this wonderful meaningful thing together that affected a greater community that's really where i got a lot of confidence as a creator i felt affirmed and validated by my friends and by kind of the things we were doing I was like okay i i feel i feel like i can I felt bra brave enough, I felt emboldened to actually go down the creative career path a little more. So instead of clinging to my, my salaried, safe job that I knew I could keep, I, I was like, no, because of how, I f how, how things are going with this community, how I feel, uh, just the fact that I enjoy it, it made it feel very natural for me to take the next step and apply to art school and take that proverbial leap from my comfortable salary job to the great unknown as a poor student once again. So yeah, after three years of investing in a totally different direction, it was, it just, it felt right to make that leap. And I can speak one day actually about what, how I think the, the idea of a leap of faith is actually a myth where you don't actually take a leap, you take more of like a, a confident step in the direction that you can see already in front of you but anyway even still it was a risk and the risk being like leaving my comfortable job going to art school but it was through being a part of a community that I felt safe to do that I felt emboldened to do that safe is the wrong word I felt emboldened I felt empowered and you can't feel that kind of sense of no matter how this goes I might fail I might succeed that boldness it comes when you have a community of people you know are rooting for you they're cheering for you they're not only encouraging you about that you can do it but you know they'll be there for you if it doesn't work out so yeah I mean one other thing that a creative community can do aside from emboldening you and making you feel more creative in that way is just that every person you're working with or connected to is a possible connection to other connections that can help you. And that sounds like a really selfish, self-serving way of, a rela of, of having a relationship, but that's actually what relationships are. I think that aside from that, friendships are based on mutual benefit. And in work, connections are based on mutual benefit. And they just naturally, as you're a friend, as you're a kind, contributing individual in a community, those people are connected to people who are connected to people. It all comes back to you because they remember, oh, Tom's a designer. Oh, Andy's a tattoo artist. You know, and they, they, they make these connections and they have a chance to interact and find one another, right? So all this was, uh, all this was pre-social media. My creative connection building would have looked so different. Uh, had I had to start it today. Back then, there wasn't even Facebook. Um, the closest thing to social media were blogs. And uh, actually, blogs for me was a huge way of, of uh, connecting with people in my early 20s. Blogging was uh, an early form of creative expression for me and connecting with people just through writing and through following each other's lives. It's so different now because it used to be the people sharing their lives online were so few and it was considered kind of bold to be writing about your life in diary format and so the people who were doing that were really connecting based on on that oh you too i i didn't know i thought i was alone in that and so it became very an, an interesting community and people would tell me that i'd meet 
in my broader community say, oh, I read your blog, and I'd say, you know I have a blog, and feeling, um, this is a bit of a tangent, but I think one benefit of social media is, is that it helps people feel like they're being heard and known. And in my early 20s, I, I went through a period of, of, I'll say, deep depressive state. I don't know if I had clinical depression, but I was very depressed. It must be, it must be the, the time of life when you, you, you're so social and you need to have connection with other people. And if you don't have it, you feel it. You feel really lost. And I think that's why social, a social life is so important for many people in that age group. And I definitely felt adrift at sea, alone. And I, was, I, had, I felt like there was, I, I needed to be known and understood by people. And that need wasn't being met or fulfilled. So I just started putting stuff up on, first I had some web space and I just started sharing stuff on there like pictures I took with my digital camera and songs that I wrote, just like the words to songs. Oh yeah, I would take pictures of like sculptures I made, and paintings I made, and I just put it on this thing like I hand coded everything and it was just like this really archaic website. and. People were actually reading it. Maybe it was like five or ten of my friends. But then I found out about blogging. And I started doing that and writing and people commenting on my posts just about like what happened that day or my, my dreams for the future. You know, I, I really started having that need to feel connected and known and understood and that people are interested in reading about my life really, really brought life into me and really encouraged me it made me feel important, I guess, not self-important, but just made me feel like I am, I'm, I have a story that people are interested in. And when you feel like you have something to share and that, and that something is something other people want to know about, even if it's a handful of people, that can be so life-giving. I think I'm starting to see how my, so I started this story about when I was, um, how I basically started this creative community with friends. But now I'm starting to see how the way back of me just starting to write on blogs and share stuff online and say, look, look at me, look, look what I have. I have this stuff and I want you to see it. And I want, um, I want to be heard. I want to be understood. I want to be known. I want to feel like people know who I am. And that reaching out and, and, and creating stuff and sharing it. And that's creating value for other people to look at. And I would encourage, if you are, let's just say you have creative aspirations, but you haven't even picked up a pencil. You're too afraid to even sketch or doodle on a napkin. Let's just say you're there. I would encourage you, just start writing. Seth Godin has, uh, and I've, I've never read much of his, I've never read any of his work. I may have read a blog or two. This is something I picked up on one of his YouTube videos, I think. Basically, he says, have a blog and write. And if you have nothing to write, or if you don't want to share it, write it privately and don't share it. But eventually, as you write regularly, you'll start thinking about stuff in your day-to-day -day routine or experience about what you could be writing about. And suddenly, your eyes are open more. You're looking for stuff to write about, and then you're writing about it. And it builds and perpetuates on itself in that way. And so that's what Seth Godin says about blogging, but I think more importantly, in my case, in this, this scenario, is that just knowing that people are reading it is, is a way of connecting to people, and it's, it's a way of, it's a creative act, and it will yield new opportunities in ways that perhaps you don't expect right now, but I think that's the thing. You can't, you can have an aspiration, but you can't know exactly how it's going to unfold. Nobody has that crystal ball. So you have to just make the first move and then, you know, some people will, will talk about how if you give something, put something out to the universe, the universe will sort of bring it back to you. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get into whoever's philosophy is about how that all works because I don't think anyone truly understands. But, but it is, in my opinion, tried and true that if you create something and put it out there and you, you do that repeatedly, it comes back to you. So 
define what your goal is, even if it's just to be more, to do more creative stuff, and then make steps to, to make it happen. The most important thing is that don't wait for someone else to tell you to do it. Don't wait to feel like you're at a stage where you can start making art. Like you'll never feel good enough. So the most important thing is to have a creative community. People who you're inspired by and who are inspiring you and encourage, you guys are encouraging each other to grow in whatever it is you want to grow in. So Creative Breakfast was a community of practice that I started with the help of a few folks. Um, and it grew into good friendships and ultimately into the uh, creative career that I now have. And your, your creative community is going to look a lot different than mine, but you've just got to do it if you want to make those meaningful connections that will grow into these beautiful opportunities down the road. So you can start one from scratch like I did, or you can join up with one of the many creative communities that now exist today. I think creativity is a lot more celebrated than it was back in, back in the day. So for instance, there's Creative Mornings, which has chapters in cities all over the world. I know there's one here in Vancouver. There's definitely one in like San Francisco and LA and New York and Toronto. Um, so there's always that. So it doesn't have to, if you make up a community with your friends, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Uh, just have a few friends and you're all interested in growing creatively together and meet regularly over your favorite food or beverage. And so, yeah, I encourage you, go and do it. It made, I, I think it made all the difference in my life. Yeah, I mean, I just encourage you to go and get connected to people, however it is, even if you can only connect with people online. Connect with people, that's how you build yourself up creatively, by meeting with others, talking about it, encouraging each other, critiquing each other. Iron sharpens iron, right? So my name is Tom Froze. I'm an illustrator and designer in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I'm answering all your questions about illustration. So without your questions, I won't have as much great content. Your questions are really the reason for this. It's driving me to sit here on Monday mornings and record whatever I'm recording. There's no question too big or too small. I love answering them all. Please leave your questions in the comments. I'll definitely find them there and I will add them to the pile. If you like this video, please like it. And if you love all these videos, please subscribe to my channel. I have a very modest goal of reaching a thousand subscribers by the year end. And it would mean the world for me if you guys subscribed and I love reading your encouragements and your comments just so you guys know when I hear your guys when I read your guys' comments about how the content is useful to you or you like it or you you want me to keep making these videos it's because of those few comments that make me excited about coming here so thanks for, for your cheering me on from the, the sidelines and I'm excited to keep doing this. Again, my name is Tom Froze. You can find me at TomFroze.com. You can find me on social media, Instagram and Twitter. And uh, you can also find me at Skillshare where I teach you how to illustrate using digital and analog techniques. Thanks for watching and listening. Keep making great work and asking great questions. I'll see you next week.